Salam Alaikum! In my Fez and Jalaba, I'm calling myself Marty Ben Sidney to get into the spirit here in the Kingdom of Morocco, just nine miles from Europe at Gibraltar, and one of the most stable and safe of Muslim countries, this historic land in North Africa is attracting more and more North American visitors, and it's about time. Hollywood has been fascinated with this exotic locale since the 1940s. We're off on the road to Morocco. We certainly do get around. Like Webster's Dictionary, we're Morocco bound. Like Bing and Bob, Irma and I took off for Casablanca. While Irma dozed over the Atlantic, I thought about what we could expect. A camel ride on my birthday for sure. Maybe belly dancers. Lots of couscous. Slow simmered tagines of chicken, lamb, or beef. Mint tea, nimbly poured. I had done some research. Morocco is slightly larger than California with 35 million people. The indigenous Berbers, mountain and desert tribes, including the warrior Tuaregs, had to adjust to the sweep of Arabs and Islam west from Baghdad in the late 7th century. Sultans led seven successive Arab and Berber dynasties. Moors invaded Spain in 711, occupying much of Iberia and building the Alhambra in Andalusia before Ferdinand and Isabella ousted the last Muslims in 1492. Spain has a few small enclaves on Morocco's Mediterranean shores now. Many Westerners first hear about Moors from Shakespeare's Othello, The Moor of Venice. Orson Welles filmed the play in Morocco in 1951. Connections with America stem from 1777, when Sultan Mohammed III made Morocco the first nation to recognize United States independence. In 1912, French colonialists imposed a protectorate under General Hubert Lyotet. One of the first to take advantage was Henri Matisse, painting scenes of Tangier. In November 1942, Operation Torch, the U.S. invasion of Vichy, French, Morocco, and Algeria under Generals Eisenhower and Patton. Just weeks later, FDR followed the troops to Morocco. At this West African port fronting the Atlantic Ocean arrives President Roosevelt for his conference with Prime Minister Churchill. The conference at the Hotel Anfa set the date for the Normandy invasion and demanded Nazi Germany's unconditional surrender. It also prompted Warner Brothers to rush the release of my favorite movie. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. Sultan Sidi Mohammed ben Youssef of the 300-year-old Alawi dynasty symbolized a post-war push for independence. President René Coty in Paris was forced to end French rule in 1956 after 44 years. Independent Morocco, the star on its flag representing the five pillars of Islam, upgraded the Sultan to King Mohammed V, but the French influence is pervasive. Street signs are in Arabic and French. Morocco is one of the few countries that thinks French cars are cool. French gendarmes mutated into the royal gendarmerie, yet mountainsides display a nationalistic slogan. Allah, al-Watan, al-Malik, God, Country, King. 
the all-powerful Mohammed V died in surgery at age 52 in 1961, succeeded by his son, Hassan II. He held hard-fisted power. Hassan got bad foreign press when Malika Ufkir published a memoir of her family's 20 years in captivity after her Berber father tried to assassinate the king. A popular move by Hassan in 1975 was the Green March South by 350,000 civilians to seize the desolate Western Sahara region from weak Franco Spain. Saharan tribes forming the Polisario Front erupted in armed rebellion, supported by Morocco's unfriendly neighbor, Algeria. Mohammed VI has held the throne since Hassan's death in 1999. Divorced from Queen Salma, the 56-year-old king is proud to have an heir, teenage crown prince Moulay Hassan. From airports to avenues, Morocco names an awful lot for its kings. In Marrakesh, Mohammed the Fifth Avenue intersects with Mohammed the Sixth Avenue and now with Hassan the Second Avenue, changed from Avenue of France. With this background, we landed, skipping congested, polluted Casablanca for the moment. The 21 people on our Gate 1 travel tour drove 73 miles to Rabat. Moroccan women had a way of showing they were happy we came. <coughs> tour manager Rashid Abu Naja briefed us. Protests during the Arab Spring of 2011 spotlighted Morocco's problems which continue glaring income inequality and high youth unemployment in a nation largely under 20 years old. Mohammed quickly agreed to a new constitution, nominally giving up some power, granting more rights to women and freeing political prisoners. But Mohammed Shtatu, a political analyst at the University of Rabat, says the crown dominates politics and economic life with corruption and nepotism endemic. Four million Moroccans have moved abroad, the young seeking opportunities they feel are limited to a well-connected elite establishment at home. Growth, however, has been steady. In one sign of economic progress, the king inaugurated in November 2018 Africa's first bullet train, a French-built TGV making the 200-mile run from Tangier near Gibraltar south to Casablanca at up to 200 miles an hour. At Warzazat in the sunny south, Morocco built one of the world's largest solar arrays, creating enough electricity to power the entire south. Two more such projects, one to export power to Spain, are on the drawing board. And Morocco has enough high-tech manufacturing skill to assemble parts of Airbus jetliners. For all the progress, visitors are still advised not to drink the tap water. Ancient traditions endure. Two and a half million semi-nomads move about with camels and sheep. The muezzins call the faithful to prayer from the minarets five times a day. As Rashid tells us, Yalla, let's go! Modern Rabat, western-oriented capital and showpiece of embassies and stately villas, the king no longer lives in the sprawling royal palace used for administration, foreign VIP visits, and the Ministry of Religion. No separation of church and state here. The government appoints and pays most of the imams in Morocco's 41,000 mosques. In Parliament, Chief of Government Saad Eddin Otmani leads a coalition coping with 9.4% unemployment, failing education and health care, and the rest of Berbers of the Northern Rif Mountains. Berbers prefer to call themselves Amazik, free people. They have three officially recognized languages, mainly Tamazik, 
plus their own alphabet and flag. More than 60% of Moroccans have Berber ancestry. Our first stop, the Udaya Kasba, or fortified town, dating from the 12th century in Rabat. On many doors, the hand of Fatima. She was the Prophet Muhammad's daughter, a healer, and her hand is believed to ward off evil. Udaya's blue walls compensated for our itinerary not including the blue city of Shafshawen, a big tourist draw in the northern rift. Which you won't fail to notice the ubiquitous street cats of Morocco, many of them sleek and well-fed. The Royal Mausoleum, resting place of Mohammed V, Hassan II, and a brother of Hassan. On the site of an unfinished 12th century mosque, Mohammed V offered the first prayer and sermon after independence. The minaret echoes Morocco's unique style, square, not round, a single minaret, not four or more, and at many mosques, pyramids on top, not domes. While southern Morocco is mainly desert, the north is green and fertile, prime agricultural export country. Olive groves dot the landscape, with a forest of cork oak trees rivaled only by that of Portugal. Meknes, a former capital. The square is typical, guys with a gimmick, posing for paid selfies. Moorish architecture is marked by the characteristic arches you will see everywhere. Near Meknes, Morocco's largest Roman ruin, Volubilis, long ago the capital of Mauritania Tingitana province. 15,000 lived here, patricians, workers, slaves. Mosaics depict the 12 labors of Hercules. And on one facade, the goddess Africa. In sight, the holy town of Moulay Idris, burial place of Morocco's first Islamic leader and most revered saint, a descendant of the Prophet who fled persecution in Baghdad. We reached Fes, a city of 1.8 million, spiritual center of Morocco. France, fearing religious trouble, moved the capital from Fes to Rabat. The sunset call to prayer in Fes resounds eerily from one neighborhood mosque to the next. We stayed at an old city, Riyadh a walled former townhouse with a central courtyard and a fountain, a style popular with Morocco's wealthy for centuries. Venturing out into one of Fes's two walled old cities with their arched gates and their minarets. I began to suspect that a new type of minaret is taking over Moroccan society, especially with the young, but not entirely. In one of the old cities, or medinas, our first souk, the narrow labyrinth of street markets. Everyday life goes on here, but unwary tourists can get soaked in the souk.
you might notice along the way that nobody in Fez seems to wear a Fez. A district of traditional dyers adjoins the 14th century tannery, where merchants tried to sell us leather goods. A madarsa, called in other Muslim countries a madrasa, is a Quranic school dating here from 1357 and exemplifying Morocco's detailed classical decoration, which by Islamic law cannot depict human figures. The Jewish Cemetery, burial ground for 120,000. Jews used to be prominent and accepted in Morocco. Casablanca alone had 58 synagogues. Most of Morocco's Jews moved to Israel after 1948. Only 2,500 Jews remain. But the kings have been solicitous and welcoming. Nearly a half million Israeli Moroccans have visited the old country. The goodwill typifies the tolerance and moderation of Morocco's brand of Sunni Islam, which rejects violence and extremism. Casablanca suicide bombings in May 2003, killing eight Europeans among 33 dead, were quickly squelched. It's a country where we have had a mixture of several civilizations, you know, the fact that it is uh, and a meeting point between two uh, well-known continents, which is the European continents as well as the, the African continents, it made it uh, a little bit easier for the local population to accept, uh, uh, you know, differences, to be open-minded. We traversed the wintry Middle Atlas range where the same type of Barbary apes that live on Gibraltar can be found. Morocco has two ski resorts and it would be hard to tell the town of Ifran with its peaked roofs from a town in Austria. Leaving the mountains we entered the gorge opening to the valley of the Ziz River an extended oasis watering 100 miles of desert date palm groves. At length we reached our hotel outside Erfoud. Morocco can appeal even to luxury loving tourists. We are having all what we need uh, uh, apart from a little bit advertising you know uh, abroad because I think that Morocco is not that much known uh, in, especially in North American, uh, in North America, uh, as well in other parts of the world, I think we are having, we, we have kept uh, a, a very tight relationship with Europe, and especially with France. And then we have forgotten that that that, that the world is uh, really large, and then that we need to to make sure that our other friends from other parts of the world will know about the country. Uh, you know, uh, very happy, and then you. This desert was an ocean floor 360 million to 600 million years ago. Marine fossils from those eras are embedded in stone, cut for tables and other household items offered by the factories. Rissani lies along the ancient caravan route that brought salt, gold, and slaves from Timbuktu in Mali to Morocco. Morocco has 462 varieties of dates, which along with figs and spices are found in Rissani's markets. Not far away, the tomb of the founder of the Alawi dynasty that has ruled Morocco since 1666. Maximum 
Midnight at the Oasis. Technically, the picture postcard dunes of the Erg Chebbi near the Algerian border are not in the Sahara, which lies a bit farther south. But La Belle Etoile tent camp was enough of a Sahara experience for us. <laughs> I wanted to celebrate my birthday with a desert camel ride. I got my wish and managed to stay aboard. My camel was named Unga. Irma's was Acne. I hold silver. <laughs> Put the right foot in tight. Lock it with your left foot. Then when you are ready to go, hit her on the shoulder and say hat hat hat. Hat hat hat. Rashid, the camel driver, guided us to a view of the setting sun. Morocco's Arabic name is Al-Maghrib, the west, the place where the sun sets. Sunrise and back to civilization through the palm groves and gorges of the Dades Valley. Warzazat, home of two movie studios. Filmmakers from Hollywood and Europe have employed Moroccan desert locations for scores of productions, including Game of Thrones, Lawrence of Arabia, Queen of the Desert, Jewel of the Nile. The studios are within sight of the great solar power facility. <laughs> Ancient caravan stop Ait Ben Hadou. A stirring site on its hillside is a UNESCO World Heritage Site on the Onia River. Here it was Irma's turn for a birthday cake. View will give you an idea a little bit about it. So, and behind, to the left side, to the right. <laughs> Martyr's Hill was the location for a scene in Gladiator, starring Russell Crowe. For hours, our bus lurched through the High Atlas on a narrow road built by the French in the 1920s to avoid local uprisings. The government is enlarging the road now. That slowed us even more. After reaching the 7,400-foot summit of the pass, we were glad to glimpse Mount Tubkal at 13,674 feet, Africa's second highest peak after Kilimanjaro. We were nearing the most touristy city in Morocco, legendary Marrakesh. Winston Churchill enjoyed painting Marrakesh scenes so much that he dragooned Franklin Roosevelt in his wheelchair up a tower for the British leader's favorite view. Graham Nash of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young put the city further on the map in 1966 when he wrote Marrakesh Express. There really is a train you can take to Marrakesh, arriving at the imposing railroad station. I wished we had taken the train. First impressions for passengers, a busy commercial center with all buildings clad in the rosy red color of the local stone. Most visitors to the Red City head straight for the old walled Medina, where shoppers who can withstand the pushy hawkers 
can haggle for an occasional bargain after paying off the snake charmers and other photo op specialists in the big central square, the Jama El Fna. <laughs> In the crowded, noisily chaotic souk, Irma was in a shopper's heaven of Berber jewelry, rugs, and other merchandise. Landmark of Marrakesh is the 12th century Kutubia Mosque, the bookseller's mosque, built by Sultan Abd el Mumen to mark his Almohad family's victory over the Almoravid dynasty. Then you might visit the Bahia Palace, not historically important as the late 19th century residence of a powerful Grand Vizier and Regent, but a good example of Moorish architecture and daily life at the top. French resident General Lyoté lived here in the 1920s. Of note, the harem for 24 concubines. The Grand Vizier's four wives drew fancier quarters. A walk leads to the beautiful Kasbah Mosque, built by Yaqub al-Mansur in the 12th century, a model for later builders. In the shadow of the mosque's southern wall, the Sadian tombs, 16th and 17th century resting places of the Arab Sadian dynasty, lavish examples of Islamic art. In the new city, built by France, the Majorel Garden, a tropical paradise started in 1923 by Jacques Majorel, painter of Moroccan subjects. It fell into disrepair after his death, but was revived by Algeria-born couturier Yves Saint Laurent and his life partner Pierre Berger in 1980. A memorial to the two stands in the garden. Nightfall might bring a horse and carriage ride into the teeming Jama El Fna, where musicians entertain the throngs. The Mamounia Palace Hotel, where rooms go for at least $500 a night and much more. Alfred Hitchcock filmed The Man Who Knew Too Much here in 1956 with James Stewart and Doris Day. Our destination was an old city restaurant with, at last, another item on my must-see list. Next morning, a class in spicy Moroccan cooking, where even kitchen-phobic guys like me managed to make a passable chicken tagine for lunch. Approaching Essaouira on the Atlantic, stands of argon trees owned by the government, basis of beauty products for Moroccan exports. The startling sight of goats up a tree is part of the argon oil manufacturing process. The goats clamber up to munch and soften the hard argon fruit, spitting out and spreading the seeds. Eighty women at Amal Ehati's Marjam Cooperative earn money and a degree of independence by turning the argon fruit into an array of products. Skin lotions, cosmetic oil, shampoo, shower gel, and other uses. Essaouira, a peaceful sardine fishing and port town, 
was the 60s hippie haven that drew Jimi Hendrix, Frank Zappa, and Cat Stevens, who became Yusuf Islam, as residents enthralled with its music. The French used Mogador Island offshore as a prison for dissidents. Round up the usual suspects. The beach looked inviting for December, but in the blazing Moroccan summer, forget it. Essaouira is too windy. Sunbathers head for beaches out of town. Orson Welles Plaza, named for the director who played Othello on camera. I met a very affectionate calico cat here, naturally naming her Desdemona. You know the drill by now walls, minarets, and souks. The sellers here won't pester you quite as much in laid-back Essaouira. In the former Jewish quarter, the Mella, an old star of David, above a doorway. The Jews are gone, and when you see a sign reading the church, it means just that, the only church in a city of mosques. Visiting women can get henna decorations on their hands, Berber designs that wear off in a few days. Really challenging. <laughs> At dinner, an athletic group of Ganawa musicians. Ganawa, sometimes called slave music, was the music of slaves brought to Morocco by caravan from Mali and other Saharan lands. Joyous and infectious, Ganawa is the music of Essaouira's annual summer festival. brought you to Casablanca? My health. I came to Casablanca for the waters. The waters? What waters? We're in the desert. I was misinformed. <laughs> Captain Renault had his facts wrong. Casablanca is not in the desert. It's on the fertile Atlantic coastal plain. The French made Casablanca Morocco's New York, the high-rise economic and industrial capital, now crowded with four million people. The French built Mohammed V place as the main square. There's a palace in case the king wants to sleep over. Main attraction these days is the immense Hassan II Mosque, the only mosque in Morocco that non-Muslims may enter, and increasingly the international symbol of Morocco. Built on pilings sunk into the ocean, the mosque has the highest minaret in the Muslim world, 656 feet, and reputedly is the planet's tallest religious building. King Hassan raised a collection from his subjects and employed 28,000 craftsmen to build his monument to Allah from 1986 to 1992. The Hotel Anfa of the wartime Casablanca conference is still there, in the ritziest part of town, converted to luxury condominium. Another relic of the 40s is based on fiction. It's Rick's Café Américain, opened by an American, Kathy Krieger. Since her recent death, manager Hissam Shabah has taken over. After our group's farewell dinner, Irma vanished. Swept away by the romance of Morocco, she ran off to the Sahara with a Tuareg camel driver. 
Me? Out at the airport, I join Victor and Ilsa Laszlo on the night plane to Lisbon. I'll miss Irma, but we'll always have Casablanca.